Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Jacksonville at the Playhouse on the Square where they are preparing to present a play called The Boy from Fishhook. Now Fishhook is about 30 miles from here across the Illinois River over in Pike County. It happens to be where the boy was raised who would become the largest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Well, his name was Robert Earl Hughes. He tipped the scales at over a thousand pounds and a local playwright Ken Bradbury decided it's time the world heard about Robert Earl Hughes as a lad here, locally, near where he was born. Ken Bradbury, Robert Earl Hughes, what makes him a good subject for a play? Well, he's world famous nearly everywhere except here. I mean, uh, if you ride a London subway, They'll have his picture there to advertise the Guinness Book of World Records. Is that right? In the Paris subway, because they have their own. Yeah. Uh, Los Angeles has their own Guinness uh, Museum. Yeah. Guinness used them as sort of a poster boy. Yeah. But there's nothing been done locally. I mean, of course, we know who he is. Mm -hmm. Most people do. But but uh, a book was written recently, uh, but it's a very small book. But n nothing, no movie's been made of it. No mm -hmm. play's been done. And here he is buried 15 miles from where we sit right now. Yeah. Robert Earl Hughes was, at the time he lived, until 1958, the biggest man in the world. He weighed over 1,000 pounds. Right. From a poor family born in Fishhook, Illinois. Is that right, Fishhook? Born in Missouri, but quickly moved to, oh, to, to Fishhook. To Fish okay, and, and that's in Pike County, I think? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, at, at the time when he became world famous, he was still living in and around Pike County. Right. And so the fact that many people in central Illinois have never heard of him is kind of odd, isn't it? It is. And I, of course, it's a generational thing. I think if, if you're my age or older, you've heard of him because I was alive when, when he was alive. In fact, my dad said I'd been in the same room as him uh, mm -hmm. when dad was talking to him, but I don't, I don't remember that. And not only that, my dad stretches things a lot sometimes. <laughs> so I think that maybe th th yeah. that, that could be it. But yeah, he's... Um, and to think that the tallest man in the world, Robert Wadlow, was from Alton. Right. And the two were pen pals with each other. Mm -hmm. They were... They, they were contemporaries, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, they yeah. were. Um, Hughes lived to be 32 years old. Right. And, and when you have a gland condition and you uh, weigh 1,000 pounds, it might be remarkable that he lived to be 32 years old. I don't see how he did. I yeah. don't see how he did. Um, technically, there have been people who've been heavier since then but none of them could walk. So the actual definition is he's the largest man to ever walk the earth uh -huh, because uh -huh. the rest of them haven't been mobile. Yeah. And of course, if he were born today, they could fix that glandular problem yeah. like that. Yeah. And in fact, uh, it was caused by whooping cough and we have vaccines for that too. So right, right. All of that could have been reversed if he was living at it today. And, and, and he finally died from getting the measles. Measles, uh-huh. I think, which probably caused a heart condition. Mm -hmm. But he was literally so large, they couldn't get him into the hospital. They had to run tubes out from an Indiana hospital. They had to use uh, three blood pressure cuffs to go around to his arm just to make it stretch. Yeah. Um, even after he died, the embalming equipment uh, had to be brought out, and it was actually done in, in, in a garage. Yeah. So wow. everything was... We sort of had yeah. to make it up as, as he went along. The, the, the rumor going around, and a lot of local people believe that he was buried in a piano box. Yeah. But I read that that's just a story. They actually, it was as big, his coffin was as big as a mm -hmm. piano box. Yeah. But many people believe he was buried in a yeah, piano the, box. Yeah, the, 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 the Guinness <clears throat> Book said he was as large as a piano box. Mm -hmm. it, it never did say that. In fact, the casket making company was on vacation, and 30 of their employees came back that summer to build this mm -hmm. casket j just for him because yeah. uh, they wanted to say that, yeah, we, we helped make Robert Earl Hughes's casket. I, I understand it, it, about 30 or 40 years ago, you started cogitating about writing a play about Hughes and it took you quite a while to get it done. But what was it about him, not just his size, but what was it about him that made him 
a worthy subject for a play. I'm still trying to get over the word cogitated. <laughs> that is very good. <laughs> um, well, I, I was born within 15 miles of, yeah. of where he lived most of his life. And, uh, you know, if you're a little kid, I can remember whenever a new Guinness Book of World Records would come out, everybody would rush to the school library back before Google yeah. and see what the, what the records were. Yeah. And when you're little, the biggest, the tallest, the fastest sure, is yeah. always. Uh, and to think that the biggest was that close to you, mm -hmm. lived that close, I just thought that was amazing. Mm -hmm. So for years I thought, uh, well, I happen to write plays. Why not write a play about Robert Earl Hughes? Yeah. My problem was he was 1,062 pounds when he died. How do you put that on stage? Because yeah. I didn't want it to... Uh, make fun of him in any way. And I especially didn't want the audience looking and say, hey, how are they doing that? Mm -hmm. How do they have him patted mm -hmm. out? And when finally, it finally hit me after about 40 years, don't do that. <laughs> Put a normal size actor on stage, and then behind uh, the stage, we will show pictures of the actual man. Yeah, yeah, and then once the audience makes the transfer uh, that, that this is Hughes in front of them, a normal sized person. Once they make that, it clicks, then it's They up. buy into it yeah. completely. I mean, the secret is do good theater mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the audience will, will go wherever you ask them to. Yeah. What, now that you have seen the play produced and you've, you, you've worked with the actors and you've, and you've talked to audiences who have seen it, what is their reaction to Hughes? It's, uh, wow especially from people who haven't seen a lot of theater. They've been very moved by it. Uh, it is, I didn't write it to be a tearjerker, but his life uh, is so sad and so heroic, and in many cases so happy that that, that sort of brings it out. Mm -hmm. And every, everywhere we've played, uh, it, it's been different. Uh, Hughes's house burnt shortly after he died. So there are very few artifacts left, but there were three pair of glasses. And we ran into a lady at a Mount Sterling performance who owned one of those pairs of glasses. I didn't, didn't know where they were. Uh, in Pittsfield, just before we did the show, a lady brought back a letter that Robert Earl had written to one of his teachers. And I've never seen, we'd the cast and never seen his handwriting before. Mm -hmm. Seems like everywhere we go, we learn uh, new things. As a director and a writer, what you hope is that what you learn doesn't conflict with what you put on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, just literally last night, I was eating pizza with a fella who knew him, and I found out we had one fact slightly wrong in, in the play. So I've asked him to be quiet until the show's over. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to change in that. Yeah, not yeah. right now. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, during this program, it's going to be interesting. You'll, you'll get to, your cast is going to be here to share some yep. of the play with us. We'll learn more about Hughes through that process. And then there's a couple other cast members here who, who, uh, who knew the family of Hughes yep. and can fill us in a little bit more. Well, thank you very much. It's, been, bet, it's Mark. been great. Enjoy it. Oh, my goodness. Look at him. Mama told me he was coming. They live across the creek. Wow. And you're how old? Seven. Well, you're 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 taller than the rest of us, and, and you're kind of well. How, uh, you're kind of uh, big. Yeah, big. So uh, so how uh, how, uh, how how big? How big? Yeah. Two hundred twenty-five pounds. And you're seven years old. A two hundred twenty-five pound seven-year-old. I weighed the same as my teacher. Wow. <laughs> I took to walking the boys to school. Guy and Donald could make it on their own, but. But Robert, if he got stuck in one of them holes, well... I'd be stuck. Well, I worried some how he'd be treated by the other kids. You know, you don't have to go. I want to, Ma. Oh, but kids can be so cruel. Ma didn't need to worry. This wasn't New York, it was Fishhook. We'd grown up with Robert. We never knew anything. He was heavy, sure. But, well, that didn't matter. We were all poor, and it never occurred to us to make fun of him. And when I got so large that I couldn't run with any of the other kids, then they invented other games that I would fit in. One was Get Earl Down. <laughs> Get Earl Down! Get Earl Down! They'd make a circle around me at recess, and then they'd all try to jump on me and bring me down, and I'd whirl and whirl around, and I'd bat them off, and nobody, nobody laughed harder than I did. <laughs> 
You couldn't mistreat Earl. He was too kind. And when we played hide and seek, we just hide behind him. Saturday night was a big night in Fishhook. Everybody come to town to uh, do their trading. They'd bring in their eggs and milk and take home the food that they needed for the week. Now, I remember the first time that Robert Earl came to town. His dad had to put on soda pop cases in the back to even out the load. <laughs> Step up on them scales, son. Let's see what you mount to. I didn't mind. I wanted to know. Okay, now here we go. Let's see here. 200, 250, mm. <laughs> 300, <laughs> oh, look, 350, I kept adding on counterweights, 378 pounds, how old are you, son? Uh, 10, 10 years old, Mr. Kerfman. Keith Bradbury, not only do you play Hughes' stepfather, you play some other roles in this as well. But your own father knew Hughes's family quite well. He did. He did. My, my dad was a John Deere dealer at the time. Knew a lot of people in the community. But uh, he would, on Sunday afternoons, he would take his old magazines to uh, Robert Earl's house because Robert Earl loved to read. He could, anything he could get his hands on, he'd read. He'd even look at pictures of John Deere tractors. He would, <laughs> he would take anything. So dad would take those up. And I don't recall going with him. He said I did. Uh, maybe once, but uh, Ken had gone mm -hmm. with him before. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a regular trip, and it wasn't just Dad. A lot of people did that. They they saved magazines for him. Uh, it was the family was extremely poor. I mean, oh. poor beyond what we even think of poor today. They were. I guess you would put them as sharecroppers of our mm -hmm. time. Um, they uh, they actually came from uh, from uh, when when Robert Earl's real father passed away. They had to move to a poorhouse in Missouri. Oh. So there was, uh, well, his mother was the oldest of 15 kids, so they ended up, uh, basically 15 of them, living in one room in a mm. poorhouse in Missouri wow. until uh, he was, they were able to come to, yeah. uh, through a turn of events, came to Illinois. Yeah. He, he had, Robert Earl had a tough life, not only with yeah. his weight situation, mm -hmm. but it, like everybody else, he grew up in the Depression. His family was poor beyond mm -hmm. just the Depression. Right. Um, but he kind of somehow kept a, a, a real favorable and, and a sort of cheery demeanor, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did. And, and he started out in the worst of situations, like I said, in the poorhouse. He was born in the poorhouse in Missouri. Yeah. Uh, his, uh, his stepfather went to the poorhouse looking for a wife because he had daughters and no sons and no wife. So in those days, that was the thing you do. You went and found a wife uh, in, the, in the poorhouse. Yeah. So he did find her. and. Uh, when they got ready to leave, the, uh, his mother, Robert Earl's mother, assumed that it was just her that was going. But in the meantime, she had had Robert Earl and uh, the, the gentleman, uh, Abe, said, uh, don't you want your baby boy? Bring him along too. So that's how they ended up back yeah. then in uh, Illinois. Yeah. And, and it was, yes, they were, they were so poor. They would sneak into the uh, neighbor's fields at night and get corn or whatever they could yeah. get. And the neighbors knew it. The neighbors knew mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. they, they just, they tolerated it because they, they knew the folks had nothing. The, and poor Robert Earl, here he is, you know, at his peak, over a thousand pounds. I'm sure unable to work, but he was, he, he, he was in freak shows and mm -hmm. county fairs. And, right. And he was... Um, his, his mother was able to protect him to an extent <clears throat> while she was living. But when she passed away, he didn't really have that protection of her, uh, of keeping people from making him a freak show. But he decided that it would be a way to earn some money to help the family. Mm -hmm. So he allowed that. And he not only allowed it, he enjoyed it. It let him see uh, people and talk to people and uh, get, get out of his own little world that was near Fishhook, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it, it allowed him to get beyond that. And uh, so he got to meet people and touch people and talk to people. And uh, he actually enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. He was, yes, he, he was part of the freak show. But he was also a very happy, in fact, that's one of the themes of the show. He's a very happy individual. He was uh, as tough as life was. You, know, you and I should be so happy as what he was because he was able to accept life and accept what God had given him, and that's, and that's the way he lived his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Robert Earl Hughes, the world's fattest man right here inside this tent. For one night only, don't go home without seeing this 25 cents to view this freak of nature. We had offers from all over. 
every carnival had a fat man or a lady, but they hardly ever got any bigger than 500 pounds. I mean, they, they padded them out in fat suits and bulky shirts and pants. Fakes. But Robert. I was the real thing. 946 pounds and 28 years old. We signed on with the Schaefer's show, and one day I told Robert, <laughs> no more riding in that truck, boy. I bought us a trailer. A trailer? Yeah. Bought it from two Siamese twins. It's perfect. Now, Robert, you can eat and sleep in one end, then we'll open up the backside for folks to see you. Now, um, there's just one thing, and, and, and you don't have to do it if you don't want. Well, they wanted me to take my shirt off to prove I was real. So he did. Robert always wanted to make folks happy. But then one night at the Texas State Fair. It's a fake. No, fake. He ain't. No, ain't nobody that big. No. It's just another carny uh, trick. Now, what do you know? You're drunk. You ain't. <laughs> that looks like real flesh to me. Five bucks. What? Five bucks says he's a fake. Well, how are you going to prove it? Yeah, yeah, give me that cigarette. Hey. Watch this. Oh, hey. Ah. No, you can't Watch do that. Hey, ah. hey, hey. Oh, get Leslie. back there. See, I said get back. Plans. Somebody call the police. Rob. Oh, Robert. Oh, Robert, they burnt you, boy. Are you okay? Oh, I'll heal. <laughs> if I'd have had my cane, I would have got him. <laughs> we moved back the barrier. These folks couldn't reach him, but that many couldn't shake their hands. I hated to do that. Rich McCoy, you play a lot of roles in this play. Yes, I do. But oftentimes you're an antagonist. You're, you're, in in one case, you're the carnival barker who calls everybody to come see the freak. Who That's is, right. Is That's Robert right. Earl. Um, and so you're not always the best the best guy. Um, How does it feel when you're playing that role? Well, those are usually the media roles, mm -hmm. uh, Mark. Actually. Um, so it's one of those guilty pleasures that you have as an actor. You <laughs> sometimes like to be the antagonist. You you are, are from around here. Yes, and your family I'm, was from around here. That's right. And and you have come to know, you, to be become aware of people that knew the Earl's family, Robert Earl's family, or were well aware of him, or lived down the road, or something. It's funny, isn't it? When you it is. It is. Like I, I've discovered in this play that uh, a neighbor of ours. Um, in Brown County, sang at his funeral, which I didn't know until the the play. So there you go. Mm -hmm. And your sister had a role in that. Yes, funeral. she did. Uh, my sister was friends with the uh, funeral director's daughter. Uh, Park Rounds was a funeral director, and Anne was his sister. And Anne and my sister Joyce were friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the um, funeral. Um, circus that it became, I think. Uh, yeah. One of the things that uh, they recruited Joyce to do, or Ann recruited Joyce to do, was uh, sell programs uh, to help defray the cost of the uh, oh. funeral expenses. Oh, that poor and family. It's, yeah. it's something that my, my sister never told me. In fact, my aunt told me down the, down the road. Uh, I was only six when he passed, and so I hadn't heard the story. And, and one time, my aunt told me the story, and I thought, well, it's maybe it's something my sister yeah. wasn't very proud of. But nonetheless, yeah. that's what she did. She was probably a senior in high school mm -hmm. at the time, that sort of thing. Interesting connections. <laughs> Lots of them. Yeah, thank you. I loved Mama. I guess every boy loves his Mama. But in my case, well, it was more. It was a big love. <laughs> all my life, all my life, folks had asked me how I could be so happy being big and all. And it never occurred to me to be otherwise. And I think that was because of Mama. She never treated me different than any of her other children. And when it got so that I couldn't get out much, I had trouble walking and such, it was always Mama who was already right there with me. Folks would come to the farm and have a look at me and she'd always tell them, Well, you just talk about yourself. Tell me about the places you've been and the things that you've seen. She knew I liked that. And if you got pictures, well, show him your pictures. He loves pictures, and he's smart. He's darn smart. <laughs> but he wants to know more about the world. So go ahead. Go right on in there and talk to him. <laughs> oh, Mama. Such a woman. She, someday she'd work herself just to death, just so I'd have something to do. 
Are you going to sit there all day, or are you going to do some work? <laughs> I love to feed the chickens. They're like people, you know, all different personalities. But I had to sit down on a stump. So Mama would help me out to the chicken yard, and then she'd hurry up to scoop up the ground corn in a dish pan, and then run it out to where I was sitting just so I could do the feeding. She did the whole thing in two minutes. It took her an hour just so I could do it. Uh, these peaches won't peel themselves. <laughs> yes, Ma. Oh, you think you could pull yourself away from that book long enough to mash these taters? I remember that morning I sat myself up in bed and I called out, Mama! Mama? Mama! And then I, 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 I saw it there. I, I, the, she was lying there with the mop handle in her hand. I, 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 I could see her. I, it was my turn to scrub the floors the day before, but I, I got busy, and, and there was a dance in Mount Sterling. I'll scrub them when I get back, Mama, I promise. Then me and Guy, we piled into the Jeep, and we took off to get our girlfriends. But Ma, she wouldn't let a floor go unscrubbed. Mama! Mama! I, I, I saw her there. I, I saw her lying on the floor. I couldn't, I couldn't help her. My mama was lying on the kitchen floor, and I couldn't help her. It, it took a neighbor. He was a quarter mile away. He got into his truck and came, and he, he found her. Willem, not everybody gets to play a 1,000-pound man. What made you think you could do it? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, well, when I originally got casted, because um, Ken casts all of his shows, he doesn't really hold auditions, um, I was in a one-act at college uh, that my friend had written, and he saw me up there on stage just doing my thing, and he's like, I want that kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, he talked to another one of my classmates, uh, Brandon. He asked him if he could get in contact with me and then the whole train pretty much started rolling and when Ken and I met in person about Robert Earl Hughes I had read up on him and read up a little bit on his life and I heard that he was the largest man in the world but I didn't know the extent of what his life was like so when Ken actually told me the full story and everything I was completely in shock like and this guy was happy, like, mm -hmm, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. so hard for him, or it's, I mean, with all these things going on in his life, and don't get me wrong, like, everybody has their down times, but this man seems like he's just kind of gone down a downward spiral, but still, he's the happiest man in the world. Mm -hmm. So, I think playing him, the hardest part, not necessarily is the whole weight thing, because if you get rid of the whole physical attribution, um, like, for example, when I get up to uh, weigh myself on the scale, I kind of like mime getting up like I'm a bigger boy, but at the same time, the hardest part of getting into the role of Robert Earl Hughes is figuring out how to be happy despite everything that's gone on mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like finding that tiny speck of light in that bleak, dark tunnel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but after watching some of your work here, um, it, it's clear that there's a true love connection between you and your family. That's really important to bringing this out, isn't it? Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, I think family is one of the most important things in life. I mean, I'm a mama's boy to heart, most <laughs> definitely as well. Um, I love my mother, and I don't know what I would do without her. And the whole situation when uh, Robert Earl's mom died of a stroke, I can kind of relate that to my own mother because she was diagnosed with MS at a younger age, so it's hard for her to get around. And whenever she would fall down at like stores or in mm. our apartment, it was just, it, it's like devastating because you're like, she wants, she wants to help us out, but we're equally as help, uh, helping her out as mm -hmm. much. It's like she gives us the world and we can only give her like little things in return. And that's why I love that scene so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did this character, Robert Earl, change during this, you found out almost a year ago that you got the role and you've been playing this role for some time. Has it changed? Has it, has it changed within you and, and through you? Oh yeah, most definitely. When I first figured out that I got the role, I actually 
figured that Robert Earl would be kind of a depressing kind of man. Like he, I mean, he would get all the fame and the garnered fortune, but at the same time, he would be like, well, what's it worth? I mean, I'm still kind of looked at as a freak. But as I read more about him and I performed and I heard all these stories after the show um, of people that actually knew him and said how much of a great person he was, I started to look at him as more of just like a friend. It's kind of like walking alongside with your friend except, well, he's not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like reading your friend's diary, mm -hmm. even uh -huh. though you've never met him. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So it's definitely changed drastically. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Robert Earl Hughes was buried in 1958 near Mount Sterling, Illinois. And now, these many years later, about a thousand people have seen this play and more are waiting to see it as he is reborn in The Boy from Fishhook. With another Illinois story in Jacksonville, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.